Welcome to the Get Fit Guys Quick and Dirty Tips to get moving and shape up. My name is Brock Armstrong and I am the Get Fit Guy. And you may not know this, but I'm part of a podcast network and it's called Quick and Dirty Tips. And all of us together are now celebrating 300 million downloads. And to celebrate that, we're looking to hear from you. So you can leave me a voicemail if you go to bit.ly slash fit speak pipe. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash fit speak pipe. And you can ask me a question, you can leave me some feedback, and you know what? I may use your recording in a future episode. So go to bit.ly slash fit speak pipe. But right now, I have a special guest on this podcast, and it is best-selling author and fitness guru, Mr. Brad Kearns. And he's going to explain to us how we can stay fit now and well into our future. So what do we mean when we talk about aging gracefully? I mean, most of us have a basic vision of it, but how do you achieve that exactly? To some people, it simply means that we want to spend our final years in a good place. For others, it means avoiding health issues like dementia, osteoporosis, sarcopenia, or basic immobility. For me, it means maintaining a basic level of fitness that will allow me to continue to do the activities that I love for as long as possible. And that means being aware of where my mobility deficiencies are starting to creep in and, like a game of fitness whack-a-mole, swat them when they appear. It also means that I will never, ever allow the thought, well, I am such and such years old now, so what do I expect, to win. So to discuss this idea of aging gracefully in more detail, I have asked my friend Brad Kearns to join me on this episode. Brad has managed to stay fit enough to actually recently set a speed golfing world record, some 20 years after he retired from being a professional triathlete, so he knows what he's talking about. Now, before we dive into the interview, here is a little bit more about Brad Kearns. He is a New York Times bestselling author and co-author of the Keto Reset Diet and host of the Get Over Yourself podcast and the Primal Endurance podcast. He is currently a top 20 world ranked and Guinness World Record setting professional speed golfer, a former U.S. national champion and number three world ranked professional triathlete. And Brad is currently 53 years old and, well, he's obviously still at the top of his game. So without any further delay, let's get into the interview. So, Brad, I think a good place to start here, just as a, a real frame of reference for our listeners, would be for you to explain sort of, let's do a day in the life of Brad Kern's professional triathlete. <laughs> oh, my gosh, Brock, that was a long time ago. Uh, but I, I do have some memories of that. And one of them is I'd probably still be asleep at this time in the late <laughs> morning. So it's, a, it's almost 11 a.m. right now, folks. So, so a lot of sleep. Yes, that was the centerpiece of the whole operation was the emphasis on rest and recovery and sleep. Mm. And it's so funny now because this is 24 years ago that I stopped racing. I was on the circuit for nine years as a pro from age 21 to age 30. And now I'm an old guy and trying to keep fit and all those fun things we're going to talk about. But when my life was totally focused and dedicated to peak performance at the highest level, racing on the professional circuit, uh, that's what it was all about. And that was really where my advantage came over, let's say, a serious amateur athlete who was maybe doing the same number of weekly hours and weekly mileage that I was, but they were doing the morning swim and then rushing off to work, tying their tie yeah. uh, in between traffic and their hairs dripping onto their shirt collar. And I was uh, maybe going home and preparing a, a custom-made smoothie and then puttering around and having a lower stress life than the hectic high-tech modern life that we're all used to because everything was predicated on dispensing all the energy I could into my workouts. So I was trying to do little else. And I noticed that the top athletes were very good at that. And maybe I was not, I was getting a, a B minus or something because I <laughs> like doing things like writing books and magazine articles. I liked using my brain. But again, when we have, and this is referencing everybody, when we have these uh, scales of justice, the balance scales 
almost everything we do goes on the stress side. And the only things on the rest, recovery, rejuvenation side are your good night's sleep at night. Maybe you're taking a nap. Or if you are good enough to have downtime, like doing a meditation exercise or walking the dog around the block or things that are truly de-stressing you and, and managing that balance, it's very important to focus on that. So you're working out hard, obviously, otherwise you, you wouldn't reach those professional levels, but you are recovering much harder than than you were probably working out and definitely harder than than the rest of us sort of weekend warriors. Yeah, my takeaway soundbite, I, I like to tell this to lecture groups, is I was asleep for half of my life when I was an athlete during that nine years on the professional circuit. I slept 10 hours every night, religiously, wow. very, very well, and I took a two-hour nap every afternoon. And if I didn't get that nap, that full length of the nap, because there was a line at the motor vehicle office or whatever was throwing me off, uh, I would wake up feeling a little frustrated and my swim workout wasn't quite as snappy because I didn't get that full cycling through the sleep that I needed. So that's what it required for me. I'm not sure every athlete would report the same thing, but I was really good at sleeping and resting. And I, I realized that I needed a lot of recovery time. So I had to I had to disengage from the example that was set by my peers, for example, and just go with what felt right to me. And that's the, that's the amount of sleep that I needed. So then we fast forward to, to now, a few years later, a number of years later. And I know you've, uh, in, in the notes that we, uh, we, we established before this interview, you're still placing a lot of emphasis on recovery as a central focus instead of just focusing on on volume of your workouts or or even just the quality of the workouts now, has that changed what what sort of focus do you place on recovery as a as a sort of older athlete now well brock like you said i i've i've had the emphasis all along because i was always looking to get the most out of my body and get an advantage uh, against these great athletes that I was competing against. And I realized very early on into my career that I simply couldn't maintain the training volume that the top athletes were at. I mean, some of these people are superhuman freaks and they're out there training all day long, every day. And there yeah. was, I was just a normal guy that was a pretty good runner in high school and college and trying to make it on the circuit. And uh, so that's the first lesson that everyone should just be self-referenced here rather than reading through a magazine and, and seeing that you should run 30 to 40 miles a week if you want to run a marathon. All that stuff is uh, it's it can really harm your psyche if you try to plug into the general guidelines. And so here we are today with all this knowledge and, and biofeedback and scientific advancement in the fitness world, but we're still fixated on the expenditure of energy as the central focus of the fitness game, the fitness mm. business. Now, focusing on the workout itself. Right, and how many different uh, classes of, of boot camp and Zumba and rock and roll and all the different mm. fun stuff that you can go do to sweat in the gym. And our mutual friend, Phil Maffetone, has made this great point that when it's time to go and push your body, it doesn't really matter that much the nature of the workout that you're doing. If you're doing intervals or time trials or repeats or Tabata or fartlek, all it is is a stressful event to the body that's going to send the hormonal signals to adapt and get stronger for a repeated bout of exercise if you recover properly. If you recover properly, right. yes. Yeah. So, you know, what I'm, I'm trying to uh, back up and look at this big picture approach where I'm trying to send the right genetic or the hormonal signals to my body, then I'm trying to rest and recover so that I can adapt and grow stronger and delay the aging process to a large extent. Okay, so it sounds like you were taking care of yourself as a professional triathlete. You continue to take care of yourself as a as an older person who's just interested in in continuing to kick ass, which you which you are doing. So the recovery hasn't really changed. Maybe the idea of the recovery or the focus of the recovery has changed slightly, but the the execution of it is something that you've you've kept constant. But you mentioned the workouts. What would you say that your focus is now on those workouts? How do you structure what you're doing in terms of workouts? Are you doing some short Tabata sets on a frequent basis? Or are you going out for those really long runs still that you are probably doing as a, as a professional triathlete? What, what are you doing these days? Well, I'm not into the endurance scene anymore. I've made the strong conclusion that if you want to be competitive in these uh, ultra endurance sports, 
it's just simply not aligned with your health. And the older you get, the more clear that is.、Mm. So I have no desire to compete in a triathlon or a marathon or a half marathon or an ultra. So my fun competitive outlet is speed golf, and that still requires、yeah. a measure of endurance. You're running. It, for those not familiar with the sport, you're you're racing through the golf course while keeping score. So you want to shoot a good score and run a fast time through the 18 holes, and that's about a five mile race. And then I also am very interested in sprinting and have been for the last decade or more. And I apply that to my passion of、uh, breaking this Guinness World Record for the fastest single hole of golf, which I did、uh, twice this、uh, past year, 2018. So I played a par five, 500 yard hole. In a minute thirty eight seconds, so that's a full sprint、mm. for a little over a quarter mile while playing good golf.、Yeah. So those are fun stuff. But it, it, the the big picture is that I want to be、uh, a, a more broader、uh, representation of fitness than a triathlete. So I want to maintain muscle mass and strength and do some of the Brock Armstrong stuff and get in the gym and、mm-hmm. become competent at at deadlifting and things like that that I didn't pay much attention to when I was just swimming, biking, and running. So I have a more broad based fitness. Approach and one thing that I really、uh, appreciate these days is this、uh, popularity of the polarized training. So when I'm going out for a workout, I'm very strongly uh, uh, against k- those kind of hard. That's a quote from Dave Scott, the Iron Man legend, where he says, "When you go out there and do quote kind of hard, kinda that's hard. when you really get yourself into into、uh, long term." Uh, destructive patterns of overtraining. So I'm either jogging what is now very slowly because I'm not a professional at the elite level anymore. So I'm, I'm maintaining an aerobic heart rate, which for me is about a nine-minute mile, maybe a little bit slower than that.、Mm. And that's the Maffetone formula: 180 minus my age in heartbeats per minute. So I'm running in the 120s in my heart rate, and that's a nice, easy aerobic exercise. There's no stress involved there. And it doesn't require recovery time or you know sore muscles or any of that nonsense that like say a tempo run or something that's too strenuous. So I'm either doing a very slow aerobic workout or I'm doing a proper high intensity strength training session or a sprint workout. And the sprint workout is、uh, predicated on explosive performance with sufficient rest in between each effort so that I can maintain. That high level of explosive performance that I did on the first rep on the last one. So a sprint workout for me will be maybe six times a hundred meters on the on the football field、uh, with extensive rest in between each exercise. And so it seems like a pretty wimpy workout.、Uh, I'm not I'm not resting 20 seconds and then jumping back into it. But what happens is I'm able to work that top end. I'm sending those genetic and hormonal signals to build muscle, burn fat,、uh, optimize the. Uh, the the energy the the cocktail of adaptive hormones norepinephrine、uh, all that great stuff that's you know giving me the anti aging pulse but the workout overall is not that strenuous because I'm simply jogging to the track I'm doing extensive drills and preparatory exercises so I don't get hurt and then I'm blasting these sprints which take all of you know 15 seconds and I'll do four to six of them and that's the whole session but、mm. if I if I can do this. Let's say the rest of my life, and go out to that track once every seven to ten days, and and show that explosive top end that I'm still competent at that. That's going to be a fabulous、uh, aspect of anti aging protocol, as as well as getting enough sleep and eating the right foods. So you're you're doing these workouts, and so you're doing this sort of polarized idea of training, getting some some short and hard workouts, but also getting some of the some of those not necessarily long, but some of those easy workouts, but Then, sort of circling back to that recovery aspect, how do you know when to when to do which of those workouts, or when do you know to not do any workouts and just go for a, a walk? Good question. You must be a professional at this, huh? You're, 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 <laughs> we're digging deep now. Yes, we've tried so hard to give a、uh, a methodical. Uh, you know, s- scientific robotic answer to this, and the answer is that you just have to 
cultivate an intuitive approach to your exercise goals and suppress the, the, the massive demands of your ego to go and accomplish something each and every day or to hit the uh, pre-proscribed uh, schedule of, of workouts because you're preparing for a distant goal event. And this was something that I had to work through uh, with great difficulty, I might add, when I was a professional athlete. Because remember, my heart and soul was going into this career. It was the way that I was able to, uh, for example, buy my groceries or pay my mortgage was how well I did on the competitive race. Mm -hmm. And so it was very difficult to take a day off and say, this is in my best interest right now. I have to tone down my misplaced competitive intensity and you know back off or if a, mm -hmm. if a if a goofer passes me on the bike trail with you know tube socks and no helmet and a, and a, a flappy t-shirt and I'm wearing my my kit um, I have to let that person go even though my competitive instinct wants to go blast them and show them who's boss on the bike trail that day and so the better we get at cultivating an intuitive approach to exercise, oh man, you open up all these wonderful doors whereby when it's time to deliver a peak performance effort, you have rested and become motivated and focused properly so that you can actually get the most out of your body on those days when, when you're ready to go. And I always, I can always tell when I'm rip roaring and ready to go and I can't wait to go do the workout and I'm tapping my leg at my work desk because I know that in 30 minutes I'm going to leave and go blast some sprints. And mm. if I don't feel like that, that's a strong indication that something's off and it's time to harness your energy, you know, feel strong and fantastic at rest before you even contemplate a workout and start proceeding down that path rather than the obsessive compulsive path of thinking that some regimented schedule is going to get you there. Now, let's bring it completely full circle and, and leave the folks off with some nice actionable tips in terms of how they can use this information or use this philosophy to, to stay at the, the top of their game. And, and stay nice and fit, no matter what their age or, or their background. First one is avoid those in-between kind of hard workouts. So when you're developing the aerobic system, when you're developing endurance, go very, very slow. Go much slower than you're accustomed to or that even feels uh, comfortable to your ego. And that will allow the aerobic system to develop without interruption from overstress patterns. And it's been proven by the performances uh, of the elite athletes in all the endurance sports for over 60 years now, going back to New Zealand, Peter Snell, where jogging will translate into uh, explosive peak performance at shorter distance events. And then secondly, when it's time to go hard, go hard and then go home and make sure you're 100% rested and motivated to deliver a peak performance effort. And if you find out uh, halfway through your, your warm-up or your preparatory drills that you're just feeling a little bit flat, or you go and do your first sprint out of a planned session of six and it just doesn't feel right, you pull the plug and you go home. Just like the great sprinters of uh, the Olympic champions that will go do uh, a meet up in, uh, in, in the summertime and they've, they've traveled to a city and they're the featured athlete and they're warming up and they say, oh, I have a twinge in my hamstring. Sorry, I'm out today. And they're very, very good at pulling the plug when they're not right. So mm. uh, us recreational folks need to heed that same example. When your body's right, it will give you a strong message that today is the day to throw down. And if you're not feeling it, it's okay to wait and be patient until the time comes. And then I think one final thing would be, what do you do in between those workouts to, to stay a, a healthy and, and mobile human? Uh, you go back through Brock's archives to the Katie Bowman show, mm. and you live a healthy, active, high movement lifestyle, because that is the missing piece for almost the great majority of fitness enthusiasts are doing great turning in their workouts and then they're sitting on their butt all day as they ride the subway and go to work and they take the elevator up to floor seven instead of just ascending the steps and then they listen to the dog whine in the corner instead of taking the dog for a nice 15 minute walk every evening so we have a desperate need for more extensive ordinary everyday movement i like to walk out when i throw the garbage away there's it happens to be a hexagonal deadlift bar right there in my side yard on the way to the garbage Surprise. can. Yeah. And so I will go do six reps of deadlift and then go back about my busy day. 
Does that count as a workout? I don't know. I don't care. Maybe it does. But it's part of the active lifestyle goal that is separate and distinct from your training goals and what you're doing in the gym when you're, you're going for a proper workout. And you don't have to buy a, a hexagonal deadlift bar either. You could have just lifted the, the garbage can, I suppose. Uh, you can drop in your cube right now if you're listening at work, which I highly recommend people do that instead of work. Uh, <laughs> just drop for 20 deep squats. And guess what? Uh, if you think that's trivial, let me tell you, uh, let's find out how you feel on reps 17, 18, 19, and 20. When you do 20 deep squats, that's a pretty significant effort, and a lot of people will be feeling the burn halfway through. So if you can start throwing that into your game, it's going to have a profound effect on your overall fitness. Uh, go on YouTube and type Brad Kern's morning routine. Oh, and yeah. I show the uh, the series of leg movements that I do uh, as soon as I wake up every single day. It takes about 12 minutes and it, it forms a fabulous foundation for all my other fitness activities because it has to do with flexibility, mobility. I'm working the hamstrings, the hip flexors. And it's just an afterthought. It's something I do that is part of my daily routine, part of my daily life, but it contributes really nicely to my fitness goals and my injury prevention. And I would hazard to guess it, it contributes to your mindset of being someone who is an active individual rather than a sedentary individual. If you launch yourself into some movement practice, whenever the opportunity presents itself, you're telling your body and your mind and your psyche and everything else that you are the kind of person who moves and is active rather than sedentary and, and all the things that come along with that. I like that, Brock. I, I know uh, Katie has this quote, the lazy athlete mentality, and it's that we give ourselves these hall passes to avoid all forms of activity because we did a kick butt workout that, that morning in the gym. So we're going to have our, our significant other take out the garbage while we're lounging on the TV because we did a, a killer spinning class. And when you get into that lazy athlete mentality, um, it's a pretty serious problem, not only for the, when you describe that mindset shift, but also uh, you have health conditions that are associated with prolonged periods of inactivity. It's called the active couch potato syndrome, and it strikes the fitness enthusiast as well. If you're, if you're inactive for, uh, you know, 23 hours of the day, but you go to the gym for one hour, it doesn't quite measure up when you're talking about overall lifestyle pattern. I couldn't have wrapped it up better myself. Thanks, Brad. It's been awesome having you on the Get Fit Guy podcast. And just one more time, from from your own mouth, where can people find you? Oh, go over to bradkearns.com. There's all kinds of fun things there, especially my podcast that I started recently called Get Over Yourself. And that's nice. a, a broad-based, uh, fun-loving, uh, humorous, but trying to capture all the things that we need to live a healthy, happy, balanced lifestyle. So I think the, the programming will be refreshing and interesting, and I appreciate getting in with the Get Fit Guy, the, the Get Fit Guy. <laughs> uh, lots of fun, as always. Thanks, Brad. Get Fit Guy is written, narrated, and produced by me, Brock Armstrong, with some heavy lifting and editorial support from Beata Santora. Our sprinting social community manager is Morgan Ratner, and our endurance advertising manager is Michelle Margulis, and our head coach at Macmillan Audio is Kathy Doyle. Now, don't forget, you can leave me a voicemail if you go to bit.ly slash fitspeakpipe, and I'd be happy to hear from you. And you can also find me on Facebook and Twitter. I'm just at GetFitGuy, and of course, at BrockArmstrong.com. Now, what are you waiting for? Get out there and stay fit. Stay fit.